Ladies and gentlemen, how's it going? It's your co-host, Dervin, with Synonyms of Sound. Uh, we're back again, episode two, season two. It's your second co-host, Tony, and we're very excited to announce this guest that we have on our season two show, um, Frank Morrison, um, artist, entrepreneur, book author, um, and many more accolades to his name, and award-winning um, author and writer as well. So, Frank? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me, fellas. What's up, man? All right. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Definitely. definitely. Likewise. 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 So, Frank, I know I I, I came across your artwork at a um, exhibit that you had in Brooklyn a couple years ago. I think it was like around 2018, 2017. Mm -hmm. I was in Brooklyn. Loved your work. Yeah. Been following you since then. I think you have a unique style to your to the to the art that you produce. Um, you can also see that in a couple of his books, um, his most <laughs> recent book that he just released. Okay, um, it's amazing. Uh, definitely got it for my kids. Don't have kids yet, but <laughs> I know my kids will love this. So. <laughs> and one of your more earlier books, I think this is book number two for you when mm -hmm. you first started doing illustration. Mm -hmm. um, well, we'll deep dive into this a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, before getting into this, we'd love to know a little bit more about the backstory for Frank that we know today. Oh, wow. um, tell us a little bit about yourself as as a kid. How did this all kick off for you? Well, um, I'm I just turned fifty one, so a lot of cats in the fifty could get where I'm coming from with this. This is I came up in um, I was born in the seventies, but I grew up a lot. A lot of my style came from the eighties, you know. So I was there around when hip hop started, and and, um, mm -hmm. and I remember the first time I heard like my first hip hop song because I grew up in Jersey. So I remember the first hip hop song I ever heard. It was like two years ago. A friend of mine asked me to say some MC rhymes, and the crazy part mm. about the crazy part about that was um, put me inside his Cadillac, chauffeur drove off. Now I'm thinking chauffeur drove off, never came back. You know, you like and you and I'm in the back of my yard in my grandmother's house. You know, I'm listening mm -hmm. to this on this little radio, and I'm like, wow, this is this sounds like mine. You know what I'm saying? It sound like. Mm -hmm. it, is hip hop felt like a, a toy for a generation of kids that grew up that had to listen to their family, their father's radio in the car, or their mm -hmm. mother's radio on their um, re mother's records on a record player. And now you get the chance to hear something that's yours and unique. You know, it was Shylights and Temptations and all that was dope. And, you know, I think um, Patty the Bell and all, you know, Smokey Robinson's was, was killing it back then. You know, it was, but we mm -hmm. had something that was that beat. And it sounded like it was coming from a street. It sounded like it was coming from your heartbeat. And something about mm -hmm. that hip hop back then just generated, I think it just resonated with me. And um, and so what ended up happening, you had the music, and then next thing you know, you it trickled in later, because I lived in Jersey, but next thing you know, you start seeing the graffiti. And you start seeing uh, mm. break dancing. And all that stuff starts trickling in. And you start, that becomes, now you're not doing your hustle like your mom's in them. Now you have your own dance. You're not doing the paintings that your parents understand. You're doing letters and characters that you understand. Whether you take it from The Hobbit and put it next to your name, or you're doing things that match what your culture is doing, and you find your own identity. And I think that's what hip-hop did. And it was, yeah. it was started from poor. You know, so it didn't have to be a, a certain lifestyle or a certain uh, plateau you had to live at. You didn't need to be in a in a mansions. You didn't have to be in that Cadillac, the sofa mm -hmm. Cadillac. You know what I'm saying? Sofa driving on, driving on. Hip hop was just it was all original. It was all it, you couldn't buy it. It was something that you had to actually go out and it was free. You know, and you didn't mm. need to go out and buy a, a, a pair of sneakers. Just the break dance. You just had to go find some cardboard, you know. So it was accessible. It. it was accessible to us. You didn't. You you didn't need to have a radio. Your man's might have your radio. He might be the one bring that radio to the to the to where you need to. You know, to the where you're breaking at or something like that. Graffiti. You could you everybody switching markers. We all making. We all tagging and doing whatever in our black books. So it was like accessible, and it was an art. And this is the thing I was telling. It's kind of weird. It was an art. We were all drawn into arts, the arts, whether yeah, it be dancing, whether it be the visual arts, literary arts, because you're writing your rhymes, or just literally song writings. You know, we were those guys, and then you had the DJ that's mixing. 
you know, mixing, putting these songs together. Red Alert, DJ Red Alert, Flex right now. But the thing is, is that now this, now this whole culture, you think about this. In hindsight, we were the brilliance that came out of hip hop. We were, we made a culture, a subculture that, that till today still stands strong and they're still mm-hmm. influencing. And that's the culture I came out of. And it's, and so, you know, and, you know, it's kind of weird because it's like, that's, that was, that was the eighties. You grew up every day, waking up, running around, break dancing, doing graffiti, um, chasing girls, getting in trouble. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and I'm painting a piece right now. Um, it's it's um uh, it's about it's called it it was it was weird because it's influenced by so um it's a, a song called Renegade of the Common Age right it's Common Age for Renegade it's so sound mm-hmm. forcing them and I started painting this orange background I said this thing sounds looks familiar and then when I look back at it I'm like yo hold on. I looked at the video it's the same setting sunset that um is in the video was in this picture right here. And I was like, wow, that's kind of weird. That's I wouldn't even. I was just thinking that subliminally, and here it is. I'm painting it. And if the, if you remember the video, there's a a wall in the middle of nowhere, and it mm-hmm. just floats around. Eventually, you know, AD graphic weren't the best, but these kids coming out into this field, and they see this graffiti wall, and then everything around that. And that's my style right now. As I paint, I want to show that grittiness of where things came from as we move forward in the future so we don't forget what it took for us to get there. That's what that's the style I'm working on now. But I'm sorry, I talked too much. What was your question? <laughs> no, no, no. You, you answered the question. How did it all start? Okay. Yeah, you, you gave us the origin story. Yeah, don't yeah. don't don't worry about rambling. That's right, the, we're here we're here for that. Yeah, that's where that's where it started. I'll be honest. I had to I can't say I grew up in a family that was like my mom's was like beating the mess out of me or nothing like that or my father did this. You know, my stepfather came into the picture, but he was like in the um, karate. You know what I'm saying? So he we was doing Chinese push-ups and stuff like that. And, and I was blessed to have a um we you know, we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, but um nobody around us. Unfortunately, everybody was broke around us. <laughs> so you didn't have you ain't had no shoes, they nobody I mean, had shoes, you know. But you know it's interesting because because you're you're dealt with adversity, you come up with creative ways to become more successful. Yeah. Because you have that grit, you understand like hard times, you understand what success looks like. So, you know, you weren't given like, you know, the traditional art school um, education. You kind of learned on your own. You made mistakes. You started with graffiti. Mm -hmm. Now you do beautiful canvases Mm -hmm. um, that I've seen. So I know your work is uh, impeccable. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess the question is, what's the longest piece that you've worked on that took the longest? Like I know each piece takes like time, but... If you could recall, like, what was a piece that you worked on that took, like, forever to finish, from start to finish? Like, how long did that take? It doesn't really matter the time, to be honest with you. I've seen, uh, when you tag it on a wall, you just write your name real quick. But Phase 2 did it so dope. You know what I'm saying? It took them two seconds, but there's brilliance behind that. You know, that tag. So I don't really go off for time. Because I'm, I was that, I remember when I was doing the show's, Back in the day, um, I don't know if anybody remembers this. Back um, when I used to do this Black Fine Art show in um, in in, um, in New York, right over there off of what was it House and Street, and we used to do mm-hmm. that show. Yep. It was really dope. There was an artist who used to come come up out of the blue. His name was Shadow, my man Shadow. Anybody used to go over there, they know Shadow. He had a big hat, big straw hat, country country's all hell. Come up and do this, and he'd come up and with this black sheet of paper and draw something really quick. And you ask him, yo, what's the price right now, man? He said, in the morning, I need breakfast. At the noon, I need lunch. Get me in the evening. <laughs> it. it might be a little cheaper. But right now, it's... Got breakfast. it, got it. You know what I'm saying? So you got look it. at this guy, you're like, oh, shit. okay, listen to this guy. Okay, whatever, man. And so he used to just draw, and he did it. People would be in line, and they buy his work. I remember the, one of the last times I did that show, and it was such a blessing, um... I didn't, I wasn't making, you know, I wasn't you know, doing half, I wasn't doing any, even a percent, I couldn't even dream the numbers I do now back then. Um, so I used to take watercolor paper, and this is the thing I tell a lot of artists that we all have a start. So when I, mm-hmm. um, and I missed the whole part of where I grew up and stuff like that, but this is pertaining to how fast I work. 
um, uh, how long it takes to do a piece, I would take a sheet of watercolor paper and I would rip it up. And I would get, it would be like a 30 by 40. I'd break it down to like maybe seven or eight or 10 sheets in it. And then I would say, okay, I can get X amount of money for this. I can get 200 for this. I can get 300 for this. Break it down. And I'd bring that to the art show and my gallery would put them in something. This At that time, was Savico Gallery. Loris really, Loris Crawford really changed my life as an artist, her and Rondrita. Um, but what ended up happening is I would bring those pieces to the show and we would sell out. But they was only going for, but it would take me to knock these pictures out. It would take me maybe like, shit, let's put it like this. She told me I bring to the show. We sold out that first day. Now we got a whole four days. I got, she like, well, I'm like, how many more pieces do you need? She said 16. And I'm like, hold on, where we where we at? 16 pieces. So I went home, got my well, I went and got my camera. Remember Pearl? I don't know if you guys are from New York. Y'all from New York or y'all from Yeah, I'm from New York. Oh, Born and raised, sir. Queens, New York. So you already know. Over there on Canal Street used to have Pearl right there. Right there, right? And so I go to Pearl, pick up some more watercolor paper, pick up some more brushes or whatever, go home on that train. I used to live in Jersey then, so I take that train over to Elizabeth and just go crazy, go paint and get it done. So I knocked out 16 pieces that night, brought them back to the gallery, and we sold out again. And so we kept selling out. And so, but, you know, but the thing is, is that you, this is what I tell people, it's your creativeness and creativity. Mm -hmm. I can think of ideas from looking at this. I can think of an idea from this. I can look at this and think of an idea. And that comes from drawing all the time. And so once you've mm -hmm. mastered the key to, to being successful as an artist is that you have to know the anatomy or you have to know how to draw. Drawing is something that mm -hmm. there's no reward for it in the beginning. As a child, you draw a circle and you're, you're content with it. And so you draw a box and you're content. Then you say, well, let me make a 3D box. There's no reward for that. You just self-gratification. Once you can get that fulfillment and you start drawing other things, you start seeing the success, then you get to the point where you're able to show your parents and they give you that accolades for it and you move on and move on. But the thing is, is drawing has to be the fundamentals that help you move forward in life as an artist. Once you know that, then you're able to establish things. And I was able to take my drawings and look at things like a cup and figure out why would someone want a cup in the house? Right. And I would say, what kind of setting would somebody want a cup? And I would think like, OK, so I get a cup. OK, there it is. Boom. A lady drinking coffee at the, in the morning and then title it morning, morning, morning drops, something like that. Call it some crazy like that. So, you know, come up with something. So, yeah. so what's what's the hardest part when it comes to, to the work you do? Is it coming up with the names for the pieces or is it coming up with the ideas? And what's the most obscure idea you ever came up with where you're like, I'm not sure if people are going to buy this, but it was like a home run automatically. I I don't care about what people think with my work. Okay. I'm to the point where you, you if you start, there was, there was levels to to that, to art. Um, mm -hmm. You Once you're in the door, uh, once you're trying to get in the door, you have to appease. You have to appease mm -hmm. them. So you're working. If people like little kittens, you're going to paint kittens. You know what I'm saying? If you're trying to make it, you're trying to make a living out of it. You're gonna you're gonna watch, mm -hmm. you're gonna do a lot of kitsch work. Let's call it kitsch. And you're gonna do kitsch work. And that means cute images that simple, you can look at it in two seconds and tell it's a it's a rubber duck. I got a Jeep, so I put these around. So you got a duck. Got People it. like ducks. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, okay, wow. Put this in a tub with a kid, boom, you got a piece, rubber ducky, boom. And so <laughs> you do that kind of stuff, then sell it. You can sell it, now you can buy more paint. You do that stuff, you do that stuff. I did that stuff for years, man. I did that stuff. I, you know, I came up for years, um, you know, trying to, you know, just trying to make sure people were happy. And I was did lithographs. I did all that stuff. I'm to the, I'm at the point now. Like I said, I'm 50, I paint what I want to paint. I don't really, you know, if it doesn't sell, it doesn't sell. I mean, but it's just thoughts in my head, and it's not always going to be something cute and kitschy, you know, that I paint. So at the hardest, the longest I've taken. Got it. Got it. I'm working on a picture now that's been working on it for like two months, but it's so big, I can't get to it back and forth. So I'm working on it a long time. But they usually, paintings usually take me about a week to finish. If it's a big piece, it takes me about a week to finish. Got it. Okay. How do you feel about uh, the state of art right now, like across the culture? Like when you're traveling in the city, like do you still like to stop, take a look at what the graffiti's like? Oh. 
or the street graffiti, art. Like, forget about it. Graffiti has mm-hmm. evolved so much. I write with um, I write with my boys. Um, I write with first off, I write with FSA. That means Family Stand Alone. I write with um, my boys uh, Chaos. I write with TM Seven and PFE. I still write with writers. I still, I'm still with these guys, and that's to be my honest with you. That's the challenge. Showing cats that's been doing this for years that you have skills to hang with what they're doing, and you still can, are relevant in that that form. Um, it's still relevant on that plat that platform, right? And right in your feedy. That's you know, it's hard to impress a lot of these guys because they just you know they just grimy, mean ass people. <laughs> 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 I'm afraid, boys. I'm like, yo, you don't like it. I'm afraid. What, what are you talking about, bro? You know what I'm saying? You really don't like it. You know who I am. But that doesn't matter in that world. If you're nice, you're nice. If you're not, you're not. If you whack, you whack. You know what I'm saying? So I love that because it keeps me on point. And it, it keeps me... That sounds like hip-hop. Yeah. You can't drop a weak bar. Yeah. You can't drop a, re- a weak verse anywhere, yeah. no matter who you are. Nah, you know, weak, that's... that's I, I, I absolutely disagree with that. No, really? I nah. think hip-hop has... I think hip-hop has changed. We, yeah. I think hip hop has changed yeah. significantly, and there's a lot out right now that's like, "What? How did this even happen?" Yeah, right. But <laughs> art, though, art, I think it's a little harder for someone to 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 uh, I guess pave their way or make a name for themselves if the talent is not there. I think hip hop has morphed into an industry where there's something else going well, on. It, art is, but art, I don't see art that. It's different too. It's about who collects you and who's selling you. It's who collects you? Who's selling? <laughs> You know, if you don't have a gallery that's pushing you, that's put you in a good collection, yeah, I mean, a gallery can push, you know, because, and here's the other thing about art. Another thing about art, well, graffiti is different. Graffiti, graffiti is, your critics are your peers. And it's not, it's not about selling your work. It's not about selling how much it's sold for. It's not that Banksy illusion only lasts in that street art world. But if you were to put Banksy out there and have him go aside, seeing or one of those guys that were doing it for since the 80s and 70s, you wouldn't even compare your work to, they couldn't compare. You know, it wouldn't be a com- fair comparison. Um, what I'm yeah. saying, so Banksy is not being judged by other street artists in that level where he could care about what they thought about. If you're writing graffiti on a wall, you're writing with your boys. And so your man's like, you and both y'all work, you know, y'all, Devin and Tony, y'all work together. You could tell each other when y'all on and off, you know? And that's how it is with mm-hmm. graffiti. So you're going to stay true to who you are there. There's no audience other than yourself because most of the people can't read it anyway. Um, When it comes to fine art, there's so many styles that are out there, right? If I drop paint, I'm an abstract expressionist so I can live in that movement. If I'm painting everyday scenes, I could be a social realist or I could be an Ashcan school artist. And so there's acceptance to that. If If I'm being imaginative, then I might have went to the I forgot the school that um my man's I mean um uh Rothko it's a black I forgot the Rothko school they went to, but they 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 dealt in that. There's a series. There's not there's nothing different that hasn't there's nothing that hasn't been done. Like I was just showing my son, um um my son showed me t- early today. There's somebody that took a spin. He's at the armory. It's like he spun something around and took a photo of it while it was spinning and painted it. So it's all spiraled and it's like posters or something like that i don't know the artist's name but i was like man that looks like a david sally and i showed him the david sally's like oh sh-. you know what i'm saying oh wow it's nothing that has not been done before in art so you can get accepted a lot of people will wonder well, how the hell they make it it's because that style has been mm-hmm. accepted years ago from either the minimalism a movement or abstract expression a movement or the modern art movement um, it has been established, and there's people upon that genre that collect. Let's say, for instance, you have the Hebrew Bentley. Brantley. Now, that there, he has established a market, so if someone else comes with the collectibles later on down the road, he's established that market, and so now yeah. it's easier to give that. How do you make money off of toys? You know the history Hebrew. Now you know how how he's successful. So it's easier mm-hmm. in the fine art market to 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 be abstract and minimalist or whatever you find your mm-hmm. game. But I tell you one thing, I believe if you do know how to draw, it kind of makes it easier to be accepted in that world. Cause you're not just left the stone paint because I can throw paint. 
I can draw. I just choose to throw paint. Picasso mm -hmm. could draw. He chose to just paint people in blue and the rose and then do abstract and fragment them and turn them into whatever. Brock as well. And so at the end of the day, that's where we at, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. who, who would you say was uh, your biggest uh, inspiration? Hold on one second. I'll tell you right now. Yo, Rich. This, this is the gallery on right now. He's on the phone. Richard, I'm doing an interview right now. And you're, all right? And you're live, all right? I'm live right now. You live right now, man. I'm on the interview? You on yeah, you interview. live right now, buddy. Yeah, and he just did a, um, what's the name? A Hebrew show. Just over the weekend. That's why I'm looking at what you just did. All right, I'm getting off this damn phone with you, man. All right, and I'll call you when I'm done. <laughs> I'm quiet, whatever, man. Whatever. Bye. Bye. <laughs> That's my man. So, but the thing is, is that um, even with Rich coming up, and that's why I levitate to a lot of people that are that start start from nothing and end up where we are, because it's not. It's there was kids that always got it, that always had, that always had. I was a kid mm -hmm. that didn't have anything. You know, you was we we found ways of getting it that wasn't always nice, but. You know, we still, you get a pair of sneakers and listen to somebody come up with a brand new kind. And somebody, what the, I just got these. But the thing is, is that that's where my style comes from, from nothing to something. And I always want to represent the people that have nothing and let them know that, you know what, this is how I came up. I understand where you're coming from. So I never forget where I'm coming from, where I come from. But I'm sorry, what was the question? Your biggest inspiration. And it sounds like... Um, you pull a lot of your inspiration just from the grit of your upbringing and you try to, uh, you try to make sure that that's uh, translatable in your artwork. If I'm understanding correctly. Yeah. Yeah. My biggest inspiration is, is family. My biggest inspiration is family. Um, my critics, my first critics is I let my kids see my work and my wife see my work and get their opinion off of it. And then, you know, they, sometimes my sons just say, yeah, that's going to sell. And believe it or not, it sells that same day. But the thing is, is I really, I, you know, it's my inspiration is, is family. Then I, then I'm inspired by artists and art history, art history. I love art history. <laughs> oh God, I love art history. I'm just a nerd when it comes to this. So you know, what's really interesting when, it, when you talk about art history, I feel like representation of like black art is fairly much trending in the upper direction regards to more representation when it comes to art. What are your thoughts about that? Because one of the reasons why I loved your art so much was that it was very much black focused, but they show, it, it showed black people in such a positive, um, vibrant way. That's why I fell in love with your pieces. Like, what are your thoughts about the shift of art when it comes to black representation? Yeah, yeah. Out of the 500 that made it, that are, that are made it, or artists that, let's say there's 500 artists that walked in the door that made it into the blue chip world. What is the percentage of African Americans that are artists that are there? I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure it's under a hundred. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. We're yeah, right. talking about fifty. Now we can celebrate the hell out of them, West indeed. But we got to realize that there is still an opening there. Not never be complacent. Mm -hmm. um, it's picked and chosen. It's. It's 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 a very odd world when it comes to this art world. Everyone doesn't get accepted. And there are rules to this thing. There are ways of keeping you out. There's ways of blackballing you. Um, there's certain galleries that are allowed. Yeah, yeah I, not, I'm so happy you said that. Yeah, so there's certain artists that are allowed. So happy you mentioned that. Yeah. I, 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 I feel there, 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 there is and can be some type of barrier of entry and um, I've always thought to myself, like, yo, who is, who is determining, like, that that this is high caliber? Mm -hmm. Like, who is setting that precedent? Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned Picasso earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, me, I consider myself like an amateur historian on the side, not art historian, mm -hmm. but I feel from like like 1906 to maybe like 1910, and my I may be off in mm -hmm. terms of the dates. Picasso's art is heavily influenced by African masks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, and then Goy. So, so uh, as well. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so, so it's like with that dynamic there to see uh, to see you know later on even in present day or modern day 
um, with how art has began to transcend and even cross over into other other industries like you know hip hop mm-hmm. things of those sorts. The influence is is uh, uh, goes both ways, but it's 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 crazy to see that uh, there's a lopsided amount of representation. Well, you gotta like, think about it. Like all of this influence, Let's think about you know. It. What do we see when we go to when we when we when we go to a museum? We see the history of a people that's captured on canvas. We see what they mm-hmm. captured. Those mm-hmm. people, those people were important mm-hmm. for that time because they were important enough to paint them, right? And they paint them, and they put them in their museum. Mm-hmm. And most of the people you see here are non African American. You see Indians; they're they're you know they're not painted by a Native American. Or you see, but what happens is that. In art history, what did our culture matter enough to be cataloged in history other than slavery? We have great photos of slaves, but we don't have any paintings that a slave did. So they didn't have mm. any importance. So as you as you you document history, like for instance, if you look in, in Egyptian times, they when you could tell when the pharaoh left or left from bad time, they would destroy they would destroy his. Uh, features they would destroy his work they would try to get rid of the images of him when when he fell out of power there was no if i go back to 1920 i'm looking for african-american and i would either need a photo of him or a painting of him and i need to know what he looked like then and what artist can i go back to in 1920 1910 painting has been around since i don't know you know i i can't go back to that history Painting and documenting people has been around. What artists can I go to in the 1800s uh, that can show a clear representation of African American? And so as we move mm-hmm. forward in history, now with the internet, now we're seeing there's a bubble of more artists. Now, why are we not being represented in the same vendors, venues as everyone else? Why, or why is our history, why is our presence not there if this presence is there? Why is our ideology of, yeah. of of movement not just as important as this rest the rest of them? What is the what is why not? What reason for what is the reasons for not? I remember when I walked into a gallery years ago, and it's mm-hmm. not far from Richard's gallery, it just opened up in, in Soho in Wooster Street. I walked into this gallery and it was an African American owned gallery. And I said to, and I, and it took you a whole long time to get in this guy. I'm walking around, I get in, I finally get into this. But what ended up happening, I, I got my portfolio up and I went up to this gallery and I said, hey, I'm Frank Morrison. She, she let me up the steps. I went in there, showed her my work, right? She didn't seem like she was too interested in it. And I was like, okay. But she saw there was a little, I was like, there's a little spark. She didn't say, get away. I don't want mm-hmm. your cookies. She said, I want, I don't want maybe, maybe this flavor, maybe this flavor, right? And so at the end of the day, let's say it was it was uh, September, right? I said, after I told her I was self-taught, she was like, oh, whole, everything has changed. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. With me. And she said, well, I tell you what, come back in August and let's see. I don't represent self-taught artists, but come back in August and we'll look again. And I'm walking down the, the steps with my books and stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm walking down. I'm all happy. I'll come back in August. I'm getting in this. I'm, you know? Then I mm-hmm. walk outside. And believe it or not, it's crazy. This is Russell Simmons sitting right outside. This is off of, this is off of print, uh, Spring Street. And Russell Simmons sitting outside. I said, and it hit me. It's September. She tell me come back here in a year? <laughs> come back here in a year? <laughs> I said, yo, Russell. I said, Russell, yo, was it this hard for your brother? The beginning, this lady just told me you come back and she just dissed the mess out of me. I'm thinking oh, she got me in there. I'm ready to go home. When I, you didn't have phones back then. I'm ready to go home and tell everybody. I'm on the, I'm on the Zoom right now. This is my daughter telling me it's Tommy. I'm on the Zoom. What the? Okay. So anyway, and I'm feeling <laughs> and I'm So anyway, here we go. I'm like, what is this? And Russell was like, listen, it was, this is hard for him. But now I go out and I sit down with Josh Rainwhite at the Black Fine Arts Show. He tells me a couple of things. And he lets me know that when I finally do sit back up there with, with this lady again, and I do get another interview, she said, well, I'm sorry again. I just don't represent you look, you because you did not go to art school. Now just think about this. Because you did not go to art school, you can't be represented in my gallery. I do not represent self-taught or folk art. Then she said something else. You would be considered self-taught folk art or a street artist. 
I was like, well, I ain't gonna be no damn folk artist because I'm mm-hmm. not painting. You know, I'm not painting like that, and I'm not self-taught. I get that, but then you look at what the the, the koi is for self-taught. You're like, what the hell? What do you? Who wants to just make it sound like you're crazy painting? So damn. Uh, so mm-hmm. then she said, street artist. I said, yeah, I can see. I do graffiti. I understand that. And so one of the things I learned is that in order to get into this, to get into museums or be uh, acknowledged by museums, is you have to you have to go to the picture book route. Picture book artists aren't discriminated against. It's not. It is a mm. picture book artist. You're an illustrator. I said, get out of here. You do illustrations, and they don't call you a black illustrator or a white illustrator. You're just an illustrator. I said, get out of here. They asked me to put my paint a picture. It goes into a bookstore. It's not in the black section, the white section. It's in the it's in the section for children. Then I do a show, and it's a group with everyone. Then I do a mu- then next you know museums are asking my work for it to be placed in their museums, for my illustrations. Now, when I try to go mm-hmm. to find out art, art route, they looked at me as though I was what do you want? Are you kidding me? We're not giving you a piece of our pie. But I went the illustration route and now I'm in museums. And getting shows and doing this and that. And I'm like, get out of here. The illustration world has opened up a whole planet where it was respectable, where my work is being seen in a respectful manner. And the first book I did was that Miss Rosanna won a Coretta Scott King Award. Then it's up for another award. It's up for another award. And I'm like, get out of here. Get out of here. Illustration, huh? And then lo and behold, I never start with my fine art. I never start with my fine art. And I keep painting both. I do both. And then next thing you know, my man Rich opens up maybe maybe 20 feet away from her. And now I'll be seen right down the street from where she's at. The same street. And now I'm being Soho. Is it is it oh is your show um is your gallery up now? No. I would love to go no, see it. It's, it's not, but you go oh, see Hebrew over there now. But I'm not we're we're working I'm, on okay. that show. It's gonna be sometime this year coming up. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I might have I might have misheard that. I want to make sure I understood. You, you said that that so, the, on the same street where this woman said that she couldn't represent you, there your a, a gallery is being opened that your work isn't. Oh yeah, it's what, that it was might it, be a block it. over, but it's on Wooster Street. She was on Spring, but what is the chance? That's right? so, what is the chance? Yeah, that's, so and then here you have, that's a full that's a full circle moment. Really? And, but the work, it never felt, it never felt it. But the thing is, is that when you paint, this is the thing I tell a lot of people, is that you cannot want what I have if you're not willing to go through what I went through. If anything else, if you're trying to take it, it'd be stealing. Now, if you work for it, mm-hmm. work for it. You work for it, take it. I paint. I'm a painter all I paint. I don't know when I don't paint. I paint like 12 hours a day, every day. I wake up at night, I paint, I draw, I'm always sketching. I do this thing all day long. I, if I'm not painting, I'm studying artists, the books that come, the, uh, history books. I'm just, a, I'm ridiculous. I'm ridiculous. I'm very hard on other artists because it's, if you're not willing to put that same work in and show me that where it came from, like, you know how you do the math homework and they used to write mm-hmm. the, the multiplication problems down, like one, 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 just write the answer and the art and the teacher would say, show me the work. So it's not a calculator. Mm-hmm. Show me the work. And that's what it is where I yeah. talk to artists, who do you study? What style do you watch? What style, are you, what do you consider yourself? What movement are you a part of? Why are you a part of that movement? What is your whole point in painting? What is, why are you doing this? Yeah. What are your colors about? You know, and that's where- I'm Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So I had two questions. So one is about how did the opportunity with Swiss Beast come to come to life? And how was your experience at Art Bezel? Oh, wow. Swiss came about, um, it because I came out with this this crazy style where I would put these montage of images behind everything. And I was pulling from the things that I grew up watching. So I would put like a Fat Albert or, or, or uh, the Juggernauts or whatever it might be in background. And, uh, and so he saw this and he asked if I could paint his children and that in that style. And I drew it for him and he loved it. And and um, it's hanging, I think it's hanging in one of his kids' house, I mean, kids' rooms. And so that was a great experience because at the moment, Swiss was kicking ass. He was doing a lot of that. Um, He was doing the art basels and he was no commission. And he brought up, when Swiss had that little reign for those years, 
he brought a lot of light to to um, street art and a lot of light to, I think, artists that may not have gotten looked upon because they were part of that lowbrow movement. And that lowbrow movement, it's rare to see a lot of those artists move up into the blue chip world. But he put them on a blue chip level. Got it. Mm. So Art Bezel. Love it. Yeah. It's like Mecca for artists. If you want to know the industry or you want to know about you want to know what's hot and you want to get off of Instagram and actually enjoy it outside of a museum or your local museum, which I always tell you promote, go out and visit, um, whether your work is in it or not, or whether you see yourself in it or not. You can always learn from art history or artists. Um, that's a place to go. You get a chance to be immersed amongst hundreds and hundreds of thousands of art pieces of art. So art weekend. So art weekend, and then you just enjoy it. You talk to the galleries. Sometimes you might get a chance. I think Banksy went one year. He was undercover. He went. So you know, you don't know. There's something like a mecca for artists. That's what I would tell them. Yeah. Okay. And how do you how do you feel about um, the diversity there? Yeah, it's it's it comes in waves. It comes in waves. Sometimes if that's a new thing. Black is in, black is out. You don't know what you're going to get. That's what I told I was talking to artists. You, you, if you're trying to catch up to what, what the industry wants, give up. You can paint what's true to you. And that will resonate. Okay. <laughs> you know, and hopefully one day. Hopefully one day. <laughs> right? It's almost like civil rights for arts never happened. It civil rights for everything else happened, but for the arts, it didn't happen. One day we shall overcome and be recognized. Like Amy, on the, I forgot her name, she painted on uh, Michelle Obama. I was so, in, like, what I love the most about her is, is that literally she paints people in leisure, black people in leisure. And up until that point, I mean, black man had to have a horn in his hand, a baseball or a football. You know, what do you feel about this black man? He just couldn't be chilling. True. You know what I'm saying? Chilling. I remember painting a picture for a show years ago, and I'm like, it's a dope black guy with a gray shirt on. It said Brooklyn like this on it, and he had a hat. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, God, let me put a horn in his hand. Let me put a horn just so I can make him so he doesn't seem threatening, you know, to everyone uh-huh. or something like that. I don't want him to look like he's, you know what I'm saying? And it's. And he just came out. Now uh, she's just painting and showing leisure. Um, you know, so that's what I love about, about you know, when we do make it, it breaks that. It gives us an opportunity. Um, go forth. I don't care if I make it or not. I do care if I make it. But I just, I'm, been, I'm a beneficiary of the ones that have made it. And I, like Lisa Beza Butler and those artists. And it's just, and even Hebrew with his show that just, it just broke brown ground out there. It's just you're a beneficiary, whether whether you make it or not, what I'm my freedom to paint allows another artist to see that they can be just as free and come up. They don't have to worry about uh pulling the same chains I did or trying to open up those doors. They can see that I can paint what I pretty much feel like painting. Okay. It's amazing. And is there a, any advice or tips that you would give to maybe an aspiring artist or should I say uh, someone from our community um, really interested in art or graffiti um, or fine art, or maybe they're a multidisciplinary artist, or maybe they're just starting. They can't afford to go to school uh, or maybe they don't want to go to school. Uh, any, any advice that you could uh, give a, a young aspiring artist? Um, don't be like me. <laughs> We're going to have to unpack that. Means you need to create your own lane, your own pathway. Each no. journey is different. That's my assumption. No, I'm an addict to this. I do this all day. I wake up in the morning. I'm competitive. I'm. I'm. I just. This is. I love this so much. It's like I can. I dream this stuff all day. I wake up at night and I think of ideas and write them down. It, it becomes impulsive after a while, and then you. And then if I, you, you want to be original because if you want to be original as much as possible or you want to have a you want to have you want to have literature behind what you're doing so if you want to paint abstract expressionism you better know some damn abstract abstract expressionists 
You better understand why Rothko painted. You better understand Kandinsky. You better know your history behind it. Don't just be waking up in the morning because it looks easy and that's what you're going to paint. I paint in mannerism. People might say one of my biggest influences, yes, was Ernie Barnes, but there was a whole slew of artists that came that painted in the abstract and manneristic form, starting from Picasso and the Renaissance back in those. I mean, not Picasso, but the Renaissance movement. And so you, you move from there. It's about... Uh, juxtaposition of the body and all that stuff that moves that goes with mannerism, like I mentioned before, um, Graco, um, El Graco. But what I'm saying is that to, if I was to tell an artist something, be understand where you're going. I speak to them. I speak to maybe two or three, and I say you have to understand the movement. You have to understand the business of it, and you have to understand the art of it, and you have to love what you're doing, and never think your last your piece that you're working on is your best. It's always your next. When you finish working on that damn piece, get it out of your house, go work on the next one and try to do better on the next painting that you did on the last. Don't over, you know, oh, this is my, you know, this is the end all the way, whatever that, you know, this is the greatest piece ever painted. I don't have to paint anything else. No, it doesn't work that way. Go do better the next day. Um, draw all the time. If you want to go to art school, go. If you don't, you better, I heard, I heard someone, um, on jazz, there's a. I heard this thing. Someone that told Duke Ellington, "You go to school, well, you learn everything you can about the style, and then you forget about it and paint your own. You, you, you are going to be an artist. Learn everything you can. If you can't go to school, go. If you can't have, a, I have over, I have a, I have seven or eight bookshelves full to capacity. So I got books all around me. Learn, mm -hmm. learn the style. Teach yourself. You're going to be self-taught." Teach yourself. Understand where things come from. Buy the books. If you can't buy the books, save the images on your phone. Listen to the documentaries. Know everything you can know about what you do um, or what you're doing. And so you can know the literature and the purpose of why you're doing it. Um, there's a lot of portraits right now being painted. If I see another damn portrait with red eyes, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Everybody got red eyes. Well, everyone's doing these huge portraits. Why? When I think of portraits, I'm thinking of Chuck Close and how he did these mm -hmm. wonderful, mm -hmm. large uh, uh, photorealistic uh, portraits that were in black and white that was done in airbrush. And I'm like, to me, mm -hmm. I haven't seen one that has beat that. Because you're not showing the vanity of people, you're showing the humility of people. And when I start seeing that in the posters or when I start seeing that in the in the paintings, other than the beauty, that's kitsch to me. If it's, if I can look at it and I can say, oh, she's a beautiful woman or just a, it's a, it's a, a good looking guy or just a cute kid. Yeah, that's cool. But we're not. What are you telling me? You're a master of that style. There's nothing deeper. I can just take a photograph of it. And if, unless you're in photo realism, mm -hmm. I can appreciate it took you 37 hours to paint one eye. Maybe that's what it is. But until I can see the emotion in the piece, you know, I just think everyone's following a trend. Got it. Got it. I want to make sure we touch on this book a little bit. Um, would love to know a little bit about how this came to be, um, what you want people to take away from the book as they go through it, as they go through the pages. And is there a particular page within the book that really resonated with you um, a particular picture um, for example one of the one of the images that really resonate with me was this oh yeah, yeah i thought it was amazing yeah, yeah. um yeah. it reminds me when i was a kid my dad took me to get a haircut i mm -hmm. thought this was pretty cool mm -hmm. um, so yeah tell us more about the book we'd love to know more about yeah, the, book. the page i love the most is the dedication page to my kids that's where it came from it okay. was uh the kid push is about a story it's about my son i read um he wasn't the kid that could fit in with all the neighborhood kids. He was like, he was funny as I don't know what, but athleticism, he was not the best athlete out there. So he'd take a football and tackle the kids on the street. The parents would come to me, like, what the hell are you doing? What's, I, I don't want to fight with these parents. No, he's don't tackle them. Throw, throw a basketball, he couldn't make a shot, couldn't dribble, couldn't do anything. And one summer, one uh, Christmas, I bought them skateboards. I, bought, I have five children. So I bought the, my two boys' skateboards, right? And we ended mm -hmm. up moving. We moved to another house, a subdivision. We moved We had that. Um, we moved on up to, like, the Jeffersons. I hated it over there. Anyway, 
So, Mr. Vinny, a little bit about that process, giving him the skateboard. Yeah, that's what this is about. And one one day, All right, cool, they cool. took him to the top of there, took him to the top of this hill, and I said, "I'm going to show you guys." Because no one likes skateboard. No one liked the skateboard. They didn't give a damn about skateboard. Took him to the top of the hill. I said, "I'm going down this hill. I'm going to show you how it's done." And it's because y'all bored anyway. I'm going to show you how we do it. We used to do it in the eighties. Went down this hill, and mm-hmm. I swear to you, I didn't realize I had sandals on. I didn't realize it was a new subdivision. <laughs> what was happening is I'm going down this hill in Georgia. Where I'm living in Georgia, and the Georgia clay is red. Now it was green uh-huh. on the top of the hill. Now I'm headed down this damn hill, going like as fast as I don't know what, with sandals on, with toes out, them Jesus sandals, and I'm sitting there like, oh my god, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm going faster and faster. And I, I hear kids laughing, and it's like, well, when this, and I look down, and it's boulders, and shit. I'm like, hold on, what, where the boulder? what is this? What? I can land of a loss. Where am I at? And so I got two choices, because all the green is going. I'm looking at straight clay and dirt and rocks. I can either stay on that skateboard, and take that hit, or I can jump off and roll. So anyway, <laughs> when I woke up, my kids were all around me, all around me you know, laughing at me. I'm like, what is this? What is this? And, they, and my daughter, Naya, back then, she put bandages on me, like the toilet paper and all this stuff, because I was cut up and all that. Oh, and man. Like, but what ended up happening is them kids picked up them skateboarding and became like the baddest skaters out. My son, Nari, he um, has his own company. It's called One and None. It's a skateboard company, Cola company. Tariq, same thing. He's called Public Transportation. He has a skateboard company, and um, he skates with Lil Wayne, goes on tour. He's a DJ, does all that, does all that stuff. You know, I used to dance with Sybil, and so uh, I did that when I was in high school. So literally, they picked up and did their own thing, and now they didn't have to worry oh, about man. trying to fit in playing football. They didn't have to worry about playing basketball, the typical African American sports in the hood. He didn't have to. He had to find himself in that. And he did, you know, they didn't have to do that. And so they became skateboarders. And so this story with Ivan is about how he moves to a neighborhood, literally wakes up in the mornings, and no one skates. And then he goes around trying to be with everyone else, trying to be and fit in with everyone else, football, soccer, and none of that stuff works. None of it works. And then at the end, he finds his skateboard. And, and once he finds that, gets back on that board, all the kids start following him. Like, them kids used to come over to my house. You wake up in the morning, you don't know what Spanish. You got kids from Israel. You got kids all from all over the planet living on your couch. They call it couch surfing when you're a skater. You're sitting there. Like, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> you wake up. And you don't know who are you? You're driving. They're riding around <laughs> to abandoned buildings, driving your kids off to go skate. And you're like, what are you doing? This is where we stopping at. There's nothing here. They're jumping off of poles and grinding on stuff. It was crazy. That's bad. yeah. That's an awesome story, yeah. and, and I definitely can resonate with that story because I don't typically tell people that I used to play ping pong professionally as a wow. kid. I came in third in the country. What? And most times I don't tell people, especially when I was growing up in like high school and middle school because I was in the predominantly urban areas, so it wow. wasn't cool at all. But low-key, I'm actually really good. You see that? <laughs> What's wrong with that? What you laughing at? You got two behind but- you. <laughs> a man, he, he holds me down. He me down. That's oh, my man right there. Come he holds me down. Hey, come on, son. Everybody's yeah. not going to pick up a basketball and dunk. I was horrible at basketball until so I moved to Brooklyn. And next, you know, my cousin took me out there and showed me how to cross over. I got nice and everything. Went back to Jersey. Was killing it. But I was in my 20s then. <laughs> I missed the whole life. All growing up. Not getting the ball. Not getting passed through. Right? But the thing is, is that it's, yep. we're not all good at the same thing. And I think that's what, like, what are you guys are doing right now? You're doing a podcast. You know what I'm saying? You're mm-hmm. not trying to, you're not doing all the negative things. You're out here doing what you're doing right now. And you're going to inspire someone, right? You're going to, this little pebble, I'm not going to say it's a pebble, but you don't know what this is going to inspire or who this is going to inspire. Because you guys decided to go yeah. out and do something different. I see you got a tat on your arm. But at the end of the day, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got my tat so I can, you know, every people can identify, yeah, we cool and I still do this. This is what I do. This is yeah, what it's yeah. about, inspiring others. That's what it's about. Mm-hmm. You know? 
Absolutely. Definitely, definitely. definitely. All right, let me so, go there. Go there. No, no, go ahead. If, if if you've got one, I was actually going to 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 inquire about um his methods to blocking out the noise. But if you've got a yeah, just one more question. Since I did, since this was your second mm-hmm. book when you were doing illustrations, mm-hmm. um, how did this collaboration happen? And what was the biggest learning lesson you learned from the first book to this book? No. I'll tell you straight up how it works with this industry. Um, when I was when I, when I when I um literally one time I I was with my man Bruce Telecky. Lord bless him, he died um a couple of years back from COVID. Um, I told him I said Bruce, man, I want to get a, a comp. I want to do T-shirts. I want to do T-shirts. I want to do T-shirts, right? And um, he said because I saw another artist said T-shirts. He said I want to do these T-shirts. And so he introduced me to the people at Fat Farm. You know, so you know I got a t-shirt, not just a t-shirt line, the hell with the t-shirt. We were doing, we were doing coats. We had leather coats. I had my own leather coats. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, my own leather coats, right? You can Google them, maybe you find them, maybe you not. Because everybody Are you talking about the eight ball leather coats I was or doing the paintings uh, on mine? I had paintings on the background that were okay. signed number, limited edition, the whole nine. It was my whole line with Fat Farm. I was nice with it, right? Now here's the mm-hmm. deal. If you know anything about any, uh, that industry, you know you're working in summer, and summer none of the seasons match the time you work in. And you had to put a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of work into it. It's a tremendous, that is a full-time job. And when they started taking my work and showing it to little kids, I was like, what are you? You're driving on the floor. That's your or That's who's going to buy your work. They're going to tell you which painting, they, which piece they like. So I would paint all these paintings, bring them to the platform. The kids would look at them, and they say, no, yes, no, yes. And they say, what do you see kids? They're your buyers, right? And so anyway, make a long story short, it was just too demanding. It was too much. I was just, it, I wasn't, someone asked me to do a t-shirt now, I can tell them, hell no, I did it already. I'm not trying to do that. It's done with. But anyway, when it goes fast forwards to the picture book industry, I told my wife, I said, listen, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get a book deal. Because I saw my man, I saw a couple of my boys had book deals. And I was like, I'm not going to be reading their books to my kids. I'm going to read my own damn book to them, my kids, right? Right? Yeah. That's, that's what you talking about? Read your, mm-hmm. read your book? What? What? Okay. You're being naive. But you need that. You need that. Because I look back at some of my art back in the day. I used to think it was this, the um, whatever. And I'm looking at it like, what the hell was I thinking? But either way, you need that as an artist. You need that. So anyway, I go out there. And I go to every publishing house and every one of them turn me down with these wonderful letters that take 40 sentences and 20 paragraphs to say we're not accepting it. So what the hell is this? <laughs> and I wish I had kept them. I wish I had kept them. But they, they was pouring in like rejection letters for colleges, right? I'm like, what, what uh-huh. is this? And then finally, I sat down with, believe it or not, and this is why I say uh, I meet a lot of people. Um, I sat down with, with some people at Dow Books. I sat down with with some mentors. I sat down with um, Josh Framewhite, and it gave me a history about illustration and the importance of it. The importance of it. So it's not just you trying to get a book deal because your man's in them have one. It wasn't about that. I learned the history behind illustration, the importance of showing us to children. This may be their only art book, or they might be their only introduction to art. The importance of why you're doing what you're doing. And the rewards that go with that is blessing your community with them seeing themselves representation and believe mm-hmm. it or not it's almost like god was like okay now he learned his lesson we'll give him a deal a week later i got a call from fsg FS, I mean, um, fsg then i got a call from lee and low books and i worked on sweet music in harlem um was the second book i did as one as you saw and the first book i did was jazzy miss mozetta which won a coretta scott king award in my first book i did when a Coretta Scott King Award, believe it or not. And that's how I got my- Wow, that must be super rewarding. Your first one, first award. Yeah. That's kind but of crazy. But here I am. This is, this, <laughs> I sound <laughs> like this going there to the literary market with people that are all dressed up in suits and ties and this and that. And I ain't going near there. Well, what's up? <laughs> did you ever have a, like after winning that award, did you ever have like an imposter syndrome feeling? Like, dang, I got to follow this up now kind of thing? Yo, or- you get to, nah, nah not really. Because you wouldn't. I, you get so busy. Like I literally, since that first book, I have over 50 books I've illustrated. And like right now I'm at the point where I have um, 
I have three more books to fulfill a contract that I did. Um, and then I'm not taking on any books for a minute. I'm going to write my own stories and, and, um, and, and go into that, that realm. Um, but I never get complacent. My agent yells at me. My wife yells at me. My kids yell at me. My sons, my, my gallery, Richard yells at me. Everybody yells at me. So I never get the chance to think that I'm anybody famous. <laughs> I never get a big head. You know, everyone, and I think that's a great thing to be grounded because you continue to work hard. It never, it never gets, it never gets to the point where you feel like you're better than everyone else. You, I never feel like that. I just feel like you got to work just as hard as me, but you, you never feel like you're better. You know. Yeah, humility is so important. It takes you. It can take you so far if you're a nice person. You're humble. Mm -hmm. You understand like this is a, an opportunity that everyone doesn't have and you value the opportunity because a lot of people get opportunities they don't value it and that's how they lose yeah. it yeah but it seems like you definitely value it you understand the situation you're in and you're hungry yeah it. so and so awesome. my opportunity what i really who i like to help are children mm -hmm. i really like to help children especially the poor kids that don't have i really love helping mm -hmm. them i love going to those school visits to show them that there's a person that grew up that can understand what popcorn feels like, not in the movie theater, but for dinner that night. I, I was in a shelter at one time. I was homeless with my wife at one time um, for a minute. I, I've been there, I've done that. I know all that from the bottom to the top. I can tell you, you know, I can tell, I can see a kid and see their pain. I taught for free for a year at a, um, at a, at a school um, in Atlanta. And you get to see these personalities and you get to understand where these children are hurting. I remember one girl came in and said, you would too. She was upset. She said, you would too if you saw your cousin blow his brains out. And I was like, what the hell? And yeah. she was the nicest girl until that day. And we were like, what's going on with her? And she really mm -hmm. just came from seeing her brother or her cousin blow his brains out. And you don't, and this is a Catholic Christian school. Um, and so you get to understand these kids, every kid that's bad has a story behind why we're not all born bad. We're not born, you know, so you get to understand the humility or humanity of these children and their pleas and what they're going through. And I'm just, whatever I can, whatever I can do to help the kids out, mm -hmm. um, the have nots is always who I paint. And the, and, and the ones I look out for, and I always will give them, my I, my library, my neighbors next door, I tell them you could take a book out and keep it as long as you want, but in order to get the next book, you have to return that one, and you got to show me what you did in this book, so it's not a waste. And so you can use my whole library. Hmm. You know, you ain't taking books that have naked people in it, but you take all the other stuff. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know and I help them up. You can them up. And my studio, the same thing. My studio. You have full access to my library, sketches, you need anything, I got you, pencils, whatever materials you got, I got you, I help the kids out in the community all day, and that's a given, white, black, it didn't matter, you have a, a urge for art, and you need my help, I'm right there, I, I view portfolios and all that stuff, um, because that's I know cool. people didn't do that for me, when I asked to get in the industry, you know what they told me? That's what they told me, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> And and I'm 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 sure that youth is very 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 um, grateful for uh, you know what you what you do in your day to day and what you've done so far. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with you individually and like your art and I guess your operating rhythm when you're you're working on a particular piece, mm -hmm. how do you block out the noise? Like how do you stay focused and um, you know avoid any like negativity or or um, you know as an artist do you use negativity? I, mm -hmm. I, you know I guess. Uh, how do you when you're when you're in your zone, mm -hmm. right? A friend of mine, Takai, yeah. he's, he's big on zone. But when you're in your zone, like in your space right now, you know, how do you completely block out the rest of the world and focus on the canvas? Oh, uh, you just believe in what you're doing. Believe there's a purpose in what you're painting. Um, some of the things I use, if I'm gonna, besides self inner spirit of understanding where I'm coming from and channeling what I'm working on in the canvas. Um, I use, you know, um, I use music, music, there's a rhythm to my art. And so you find the rhythm in your work and rhythm in that zone that you can get in, whether it be music, whether it be, 
uh, listening to podcasts like yourselves mm-hmm. or 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 just w- movies. Just that white noise that goes on that keeps your mind focused. Whether you put on some, you know, headphones or whether you just blast that music as loud as you can, you just zone out, man. And and you just and by the time you wake up, you have a masterpiece in front of you. You know, and that's what I that's what I do. You know, just zone the hell out. I don't answer emails. I don't answer calls. I don't answer to my. Well, they just call me. They go eat. See, and I block them out there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. But um, we want to thank you so much for being a part of the show. Um, these books will definitely spark a light in a lot of kids. The representation. They're beautiful. They're amazing stories. Um, so you're doing exactly what you're out to do, like help impact the kids and change lives. Uh, for That's sure. That's what it is, man. One helps in, each one teaches one, right? There we go. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Thank, thanks again for taking the, taking the time to connect with us, Frank, and, uh-huh. uh, keep an eye out for, uh, notifications for me. I, I definitely got to get my hands on a piece. Oh, that's what's up. That's what's up. All right. All right. Yeah, that's so. Yo, we need more people collecting us. We need to get in early. If you see an artist that's dope, support them, buy them early. I just bought three pieces from the artist last week. You got to support these guys so they can be the next, the next blue chip artist, mm-hmm. you know, and keep them over and always support your local businesses. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to get a piece. There's a couple pieces that I want, but I want like the canvas pieces, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like the. Uh, so I'm gonna try to get a couple of those. Yeah, so it doesn't sure. be me. It could be anyone. You, All right, he'll get, he'll cut the artist out. You, there you go. Uh, you you've got this one foot like a butterfly limited edition. Mm-hmm. Obsessed. <laughs> I need that. That's that's the one. That's that's the one right yeah, there. I need joy, right? That's yeah, the that's one. Fire. I can see it right, yeah. right there. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like that's it. I like it. All right. <laughs> Well, my wife made fish. So I gotta get down there before it gets cold. I don't want nobody want no cold fish, right? <laughs> hey, enjoy, en- enjoy the family time. Definitely, definitely. You too. You guys too, man. All right. That'll be good, man.